by recording from New York. WBJC-FM presents Inside Gene Shepard. Rambling rose in the wild wood. Marta, let a peep at it here. Crash. Oh, hello, hello, test. One, two, three, four. Is this, is this month got 31 days or 30? This is it. After this, it's June. Just a few days, it's July. And then a couple of days after that, it's August. But you realize the summer's almost over already? It's almost over already. And what do we do? You know, I think, I, I, I'll tell you, though, not many more days there's going to be guys graduating. You know, everybody that's graduating from something big, you know, one of the great myths, one of the great curses that most people have in their lives is they go through periods, you know, these great chunks of time in their life that they're, they can hardly wait till it's over, see? And they figure that when it's over, real life will begin. In other words, when you graduate from school, man, what a fantastic life lays before you like a great vast yellow brick road. Or when you get out of the army, you have this illusion. <laughs> Any big chunk of time in your life. Uh, guys, also figure, when I get that final decree of my divorce, life is going to be unbelievable. It's a great myth. When next summer comes, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to stretch out like a, like a golden road. Like a great, vast panorama of ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> I am climbing the poplar tree of time. Oh, yeah, look at that knee action. Yes. Oh, summer. to see a storm, a door, a quiet leaf. <laughs> the slamming of an eternal screen door and the twang of a spring, the skillering of a tennis ball through the golden droplets of instant now. And they laughed when I sat down to play. They laughed when I sat down to play. Oh, yes. You liked that, didn't you? Yeah. I can see Matt in there. He's already got that itch. You know, everywhere I look, people got the itch. I mean, whatever the itch is, it's the itch. It's the deep cosmic itch to do something, break out, make it, feel it. Have you ever had the feeling, the vague suspicion that other people are enjoying life more than you are? Experiencing a richer, deeper, more cosmic vibration of being than you are? You ever had that feeling? Yeah, it's like floating quietly on your back in a bathtub full of lukewarm caro syrup. 
pam, param, pam. And you never stop feeling it. You just never quite stop feeling it. It's always there. You reach out, you try to grab it and feel it. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Maybe it will, maybe it does. It's like the time, it's like the time my old man built the big kite. Did I ever tell you the story of the big kite? Now look, don't think for one minute I'm dealing in memory and nostalgia. Forget it, you fool. Do I have to tell you this is allegorical? In fact, all of life is allegorical, right, Tony? Right. <laughs> right. Pick up your symbols and move on, friend. And that's spelled with an S and not a C. Yeah. Are you a symbol player in the vast orchestra of time? Or are you a triangle man? Are you trying to fake it on a peck horn? Yeah. Well... My old man, you know, was no different from anybody. The first cape, you know, there must, there must have, it must have happened 12 minutes after a man pulled himself out of the antediluvian mud. This is what sets us apart from the beasts. Look deeply into the eyes of your cat, your goldfish, your dog. You don't think for one instant that that dog, that catfish, that Siamese, that turtle ever has a flickering in his mind that other turtles, other cats, other dogs are digging life more than he is? Nah. He's only worried about the next bowl of Alpo. <laughs> That's it. That's why man has vaguely envied the beasts. They are untroubled by the feeling of vague disappointment, and yet vague hope constantly battling inside and never winning either side. And so my old man knew the same thing, worked in an office. And he suddenly got the kite fever. You ever had the kite fever, Tony? Well, he got it all of a sudden. He was a grown-up man. I'm a kid, you know? It's kind of embarrassing to have your own man flying kites. You know? But I don't, you know, it wasn't embarrassing. Actually, I kind of dug it, see? And the old man is making kites down in the basement. And he had his workbench. I'd go down and watch him make kites. And we'd go to the lumber yard. He never made them for me. Don't think for one minute it was one of these uh, daddy's doing a thing for the kiddies. Not at all. <laughs> he was not interested in whether we looked or not. In fact, he didn't give a damn whether we came down when he was flying them or not. He flew kites. He didn't bowl for anybody else. He bowled for himself. I think one of the problems with most uh, father types today is almost everything in their life is done for their kid which, uh, of course, turns the kid off and doesn't do anything for the old man either. And so I'd come down in the basement, and the old man's working on kites. And it was this time of the year that he used to get it worse. April, June. Those soft things blowing out of the far distant Samarkand of the south. Go down the basement. It's working away down there. And he used to get to, at the lumber yard, he'd get these long, thin pieces of wood, laths, you know, that shows up once in a while in the crossword puzzle, a four letter word meaning a thin strip of wood, L A T H. You ever seen a lath? Amazing how many people have ever even seen one. <laughs> well, a lath is a long, thin strip of wood. It fits beautifully in a New York Times crossword puzzle. And it's about, uh, that's right, it's about an inch, about an inch wide, wouldn't you say, Tony? And about a quarter of an inch, uh, roughly a quarter of an inch uh, thick. And they come in lengths, like six feet. So that's a lath. And so the old man would go down and get a bundle. You buy them in bundles. 
You know how to buy a lath? If you, if you ever bought a bundle of shingles, well, he bought a bundle of lath. And man, he said, I remember the day he brought it home in the back seat of the Oldsmobile. He had the last, by, by the way, tore the upholstery, all the you know what. And uh, he brought this thing back, great big bundle of lath. Hey, the, the bundle is about the 18 inches around, heavy. And he's struggling. He brings it in the house, lugs it down the basement. And me and my kid brother follow him like a couple of tadpoles. You know, we get down to the basement. He's got it on the floor down there. He says, if you touch this wood, just don't touch it. That's all. You hear me? Both of you. Don't touch this wood. <laughs> you know, he had to look in the eye of capital punishment. So he didn't touch this wood. And he put it in a, he just leaned it up against his workbench. And that night, he took about three of these laths out, and he started to plane them. He put them in his vice. He had, this, he, had big, he had a portable vice, and he had a big vice, you know, the one on his workbench. And he put this lath in both vices. Now, this friend is a vice. This ain't the kind that you get pinched for. It's a different kind of vice, right? You didn't know there was another kind, right? Well, there is. And so, uh, see, I, I, I must remember, Tony, I'm dealing with largely apartment dwellers who uh, don't know what lath, you know, they... <laughs> <laughs> they think they think I'm lithping. They think I'm talking about Lath Wednesday. And so the old man sticks this this lath, L-A-T-H, not lathe, lath. He sticks this lath in these two vices and he clamps it tight and we're watching him and he has a plane. Now this plane is a plane like you've never seen before, friends, since most of you think of a plane is a thing you have to catch on the Eastern Shuttle to Boston. No, uh, there's another type of plane. Should I explain to him what a plane is, Tony? All right, this is spelled P-A-P-L-A-N-E, just like a real plane, you know, like you take to Boston. But this type of plane has a, has a blade in it, and it's got a, a beautiful dark red mahogany-colored handle. They're almost all mahogany-colored, a beautiful thing. And you can adjust it so that the blade is deeper. What it really is, it's, a, it's an enormous safety razor. It's what it actually is. And, and you shave, you, you shave long, thin shavings off the wood, see? So the old man is moving that plane log. See, he used to say, watch it, look at that, look at that, see? Watch that. And he's got it set fine, which makes very thin shavings, almost like, uh, like hair, see? And he's going, tick, 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 tick. Well, a, a plane being used well is a beautiful thing to see. And he goes, shh, cross that lath. See, on the end of it, see, he's doing it lengthwise. He's just running it along the entire length. He, in other words, he's making the lath narrower as he goes. See, he's just planing it down. He just keeps planing. Watch this now. And we're watching. Now it's getting skinny. The lath is now no more, oh, I'd say, than a half inch wide. He's planed it down now from an inch to a half inch. And he had this beautiful craftsman lay. Uh, well, actually, it, you've seen, you, you know what craftsman tools are. He had a beautiful craftsman plane. That was one of his light of his life, you know, this plane, man. And I'll never forget the scene, the time that my kid brother knocked it off the workbench one day when we are playing pass tag in a basement and cracked it right in half. Have you ever wondered how a person looks at his scalp? Well, my kid brother walked around for four years with no hair. <laughs> I'll tell you, the old man, I went up his bird, his beautiful plane. Well, shh, he's planing this thing down. Is he planing it down? Oh, that's nothing like the time my mother tried to saw a pipe with his cross-cut saw. You want to hear about that time, don't you? Well, you know, he had this beautiful craftsman cross-cut saw, you know, beautiful saws. He had all his tools hung up. This was his light of his life. You know. Well, one night, my mother is down in the basement. I don't know what made her do it. And, and, and there were some pipes laying around. The basement. She got an idea that if she cut a piece of pipe off, she could use it to prop up the door or something, you know, when she's carrying the laundry out. So she takes this. Have you ever tried to saw a one and a half inch piece of steel pipe with a beautiful cross cut saw? Well, I'll tell you what it does. It don't do much to the pipe, but it sure as hell raises cane with the saw. <laughs> well, she's going eh, 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 squalling like, and I'm a kid, you know, I see this happening. Well, I knew enough about tools to know, you know, this is a bad scene. I said, Ma, Ma, she said, don't bother me. E -e 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 -e. I said, Ma, Ma, e -e -e -e. she said, I wonder why this doesn't cut. E -e 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 -e. 
Well, she didn't uh, cut the pipe, just made a, a good shiny scratch on it, and then she kind of gave it up. You know how women is. She sort of let it go, and she hung the saw back up. Well, as a kid, I forgot about it myself. Well, about three weeks later, the old man on a Saturday morning goes down to do something. He's always on the Saturday morning. He goes down the basement, see? You didn't know what he was doing. He goes down the basement. And that little echo here, Tony, I'll, get, I'll need this, see? So he goes down the basement. You hear his feet going down, and I'm upstairs. I'm upstairs. I'm upstairs. Not yet. I'm upstairs, you know, fooling around. And we had this furnace down there. It had pipes. You know, you, you've seen a furnace with pipes going up to the, to the registers and all that stuff, and it carried sound all over the house, see? And the old man is doing something down there, and he's got the, it's a beautiful spring. Day. He used to love to go down and, you know, clean out the furnace the spring, so he's pulling all the, old, all the old clinkers that he couldn't get out all winter, see? He's got this thing all apart down there, and I don't know what made him want the saw. But all of a sudden, you heard this sound. You hear the door, you know, something slam, and then you heard, What saw? Oh! He screamed. My mother jumped. She thought, you know, he got electrocuted or something down there. He comes running up the steps, and he's got his saw in his hand. Well, his saw looked like, uh, well, uh, <laughs> you know, there were just no teeth. It was all scraggle tooth and everything. He came running up this. This, this caused... This caused one of the truly major familial arguments. I mean, it was much bigger than anything that has to do with sex, those little things, the saw. Well, so you got the scene, right? So the old man is playing in his thing, like that, and we're watching him. Well, he gets it playing down to about maybe a half an inch. Well, all of a sudden, the lath goes, cracks in the middle. Oh, he knew this was going to happen, see? So he just takes out the two ends, throws it away, takes another lath out. He puts it in the vice. See, he's like, now I'm looking for a good one, see? I, uh, that had a flaw in the wood there, see? So he starts again, shh, 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 and he planes it down. He keeps planing. Now it's down to a half inch. Now he's planing real slow and smooth, see? Then he, 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 he loosens each vice and turns it over, and he planes it a little on the other side. You got it now? Now, two sides of the wood are so smooth. I mean, you could just run your finger over it. And then he turns it over again, and then he shaves the third side. He flips it the last time and shaves the fourth side. Now he has a beautiful piece of wood that's close to six feet, I think about five feet long, and it's no bigger than possibly three-eighths of an inch square. It's beautiful. So he says, okay, now, don't touch anything. And he puts that over on the workbench. And we're watching. I was a little kid at this time. I was been about seven or eight, six, something like that. And he does the same thing with another piece of wood. Now he's got two lovely pieces of wood, right? Then he takes the two pieces of wood and he... Holds them together, see, he's holding them up to the light, and he's bending them to see which one is toughest, and which one is, which one has got weaknesses in it, and so on. And then he very carefully puts one of them back in the vise. And he goes over to his pile of tools that he's got hanging on the wall, and he picks this little saw, he had a little keyhole saw. He comes back, and very carefully, he goes, e -o, 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 e -o. There. He sawed one off about maybe two feet shorter now. And now he has two pieces of wood, right? One is about five feet long. The other is roughly three feet long. Then he takes the short one and he carefully measures it with a tape measure. Then he divides... He's working on a piece of paper. He divides the length of it by two. He comes up with the exact middle. He marks it with a pencil. And then he cuts a notch in it with his knife. He has a little knife. He shaves a notch in it. And now he lays it across the other board, the other piece of wood, in a cross-like fashion, about... Uh, maybe a foot or so from the top. And now he's got this cross, you see. He says, okay, he says, quick, quick, give me the glue, give me the glue. So he's got this glue, so he puts the glue on it very carefully, smooths it off, and he takes thread, and he binds it around. 
back and forth. Now, you see what he's got now? Beautiful. Well, the next thing then was to cut notches, lengthwise notches at the ends of each of the pieces of wood. Now he's got that done. He takes string, very strong kind of nylon type string, and he runs the string down through these notches all the way around. And now it's beginning to look like a kite. You see the way it's done? And now he's got these pieces of wood nicely outlined in a diamond shape cruciform figuration. The next move, he goes upstairs, he's rummaging around in the closet, and he comes down now with a big roll of Christmas paper. <laughs> you know, Christmas wrapping paper. And it was red, you know, this bright red, plain red Christmas wrapping paper. And he lays the kite down on the desk on his workbench, and he lays over it this red paper, and then he carefully cuts it with the scissors. And now it's a big diamond-shaped piece of paper with overlapping, oh, possibly an inch and a half, overlapping the string. He flips it all over then, and now he's got his airplane glue, which comes in a tube. You know what airplane glue is like. This, uh, well, uh, if you don't know what airplane glue is, it's cellulose cement. <laughs> I must realize I'm usually dealing with the, uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the workshop naive. So he just runs it along the corners like that, and he lays that over very carefully and smooths it down all the way around. Just says, no, don't touch anything. Just, it'll, it'll set down. Just watch it there for a minute. Well, you know, it doesn't take long for this stuff to dry on paper. And then he holds it up. Well, as a kid, I couldn't believe it. You know, most, most kids, and, and I'm one of them, you know, I was one of them. Most kids believe that, you know, stuff comes from the store. You know, you buy stuff, <laughs> you know. You buy a kite, or you, you, you go and you, you, you buy a car, you know, at the, at the store. You buy this, you buy roller skates and so on. He made this beautiful kite. It's a lovely kite. And it was red. And it was about, well, it was a big one. It was about five feet high and about three feet across. With that, the old man says, all right, now watch this scene. Well, my father, at one point in his somewhat checkered career, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on the air, had been a cartoonist and a good one. He worked as an editorial cartoonist, a very fine line drawer. He was an excellent man with a, with a line with pen and black and white, and had worked professionally for a couple of newspapers. And this was before I was even born, see? But he always kept this in his mind. He was always drawing and stuff. So he takes his India ink, which he always had, and his drawing tools, and he drew a picture on this kite. Now, what the picture was, he drew these big wings, and then just in black and white, he just, he, he just made this beautiful outline of wings. And in the wings, he drew like, like there was an airplane coming out from behind these wings. You could see the wing, uh, the, 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 the wings, and you could see the landing gear under there. And it was just, he covered it with the wings. And then he painted with this black ink, he painted the wings black, beautiful black wings across this thing. Ah, he says, now don't touch this. And he hung it up on the wall. Now that whole night we had built this thing. This was on like a Friday night, springtime, just like this, April, May, something like that. Beautiful weather. And we're down in the basement watching him. And so the next day, which was Saturday, he was off, the old man says, come on, we're going to go out and fly the kite. You guys want to go fly the kite? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So <laughs> we all rush out. He takes the kite, and very carefully, and he takes the kite very carefully. He says, now, I'm going to put this in the back seat. You kids sit in the front seat. And put it in the back seat very carefully. He lays the kite in the back seat. And he had this thing that he had made in his workbench. Again, he made it in a workbench, made out of wood, thicker wood, that was in a, in a, like a reel. With, with a handle on it that had on it about 15 balls of string that he had wound on this thing. It was a big reel of, of, of string, very s tough string. And he had a whole pile of rags in the, in the back seat of the car. 
Well, of course, all the kids are running around Schwartz and Bruner and Flick, and they see this thing, see? So he says, well, we're going to take this down by the, we're going to take it down by the Sherwin-Williams paint sign. You guys want to go down and watch it? Guys, get your bikes and hurry up, see? So they all come running down, and we, we drove down the street and turned left. The old man wanted to carry the, the kite in the car, see, so it wouldn't get wrecked on the way down. So we get down to this big vacant lot down there. And uh, we pile out of the car, and he's got this beautiful kite. It's a lovely red kite. Well, now, I, I uh, you know, when you buy a kite, uh, the kites are generally pre-balanced and all this, you know. So one of the problems with a kite is to get it properly balanced. And to build a kite like that from scratch, it takes a particular type of balancing. Well, I had never had any idea that the old man, you know, did this stuff. You, you never think your father's, when he was a kid, what he did. <laughs> you really don't, you know. So, so uh, you know, it began to unfold. You know, the old man really knew something about this. So, so he takes the kite out and he lays it down on the ground. And all the kids are standing around, Schwartz. But, you know, they were fascinated by the idea that a father type is out there flying a kite. And he's completely about it. He wasn't not ever talking to the kids. He wasn't saying, oh, now you kids are going to see this. He just was flying this kite. So he took a big piece of string, about three, four, maybe three and a half feet, and he just tied it to one end very carefully. He tied it to the other end very carefully of the cross piece. Now he's got a bowed piece of string, right? Then he tied another one to the other end of the other cross piece and put it down to the other. Now he's got a cross piece of string that bow way out. And he put a little loop around the two of them, tied them together, and now it can be slid back and forth. You see what I mean? This is the belly band on the kite. And he attached his long line. He said, now watch. He says, I'm going to put on the tail. He says, this kite has to have a tail. He says, now I want all you kids to tie these together when I tear them up. So he's tearing up old shirts and old jockey shorts and stuff. You know? and, and now he's got a pile of long strips of rag that were about maybe three, four feet long, two feet long. He tied up a sheet and all, you know, pieces of sheet. And they're long strips. Now, pops maybe uh, an inch wide at the most. And we're tying them together. See, he's not tying them together. Good, you know. So we're tying them together. Now he's got this long tail, and he attaches it to the bottom of the kite. He said, okay, now we're all ready. And the wind, it's a soft summer breeze, wind blowing like that. It's a beautiful day. And so he unrolls about maybe 30 or 40 feet of string. He says, okay, now. He says, one of you kids, he says, come here, oh, you, you kid. And he, he pointed to the biggest kid who happened to be Stanley Roper, who was about 10 years old, he was about four years older than all of us. He says, hey, come here, you kid. He says, now look, you go down there, he says, and, and, and face the wind, say, he says, face the wind. Now here, you stand over there, stand over there where that tin can is, over there. Now, you hold the kite up, hold it as high as you can, hold it very carefully, hold it up by, by, the, by the center thing there. And he said, let go when I tell you, okay? Okay. So he enrolls a little more string. And the wind is blowing, and he gives it a tug. He says, okay, let go, all right, here we go. And he runs about five steps into the wind, and the kite goes, <laughs> it's fluttering. And, of course, it flies up wildly, <laughs> pow, it comes down again. He says, okay, all right, all right, ah, yeah, all right, I see what's wrong. He runs over, and he adjusts the string. Has to be lower just a bit. See, it was a little bit too high, and he nips off about a foot of the tail. He says, okay, now, kid, you're going back and do the same thing, but don't let it, don't, when, I, when I say let it go, don't just drop it. Hold it up there until you feel me pulling it, right? Okay, don't just drop it. You just dropped it at time. All right, now, I'll give you the signal. Okay, let it go. And he starts to run, and you should have seen it. One of the most beautiful sights. I mean, I was, I was floored. The kite starts to climb. And you could hear it. You know the sound a kite makes when it's climbing and the wind, the puff wind is hitting it, and it's going, <laughs> it's fluttering, and that climbs straight up, and he starts paying out the lines. He, hooray, hooray, you know, it's good. All the kids are running around, and that kite starts to climb up like that, up, 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 up. And it, it, it was about, though, 75, 80 feet high when the wind really started to take it. Springtime, you know, near a lake. We, we, we lived near Lake Michigan. We weren't more than a mile from the lake at that time. And springtime near a lake always is a windy time. It's a terrific wind because the lake is very cold and it retains its coldness. And the land has become warm during the day. And so as it gets darker, and in fact in the morning, and even most times during the day, there's a cold wind that blows off. And it's just constant. So it's perfect kite flying wind. 
Well, that old kite took off and went higher and higher and higher and higher. The old man is paying it out, see. And about 50 other kids start to come running over. And they're all hanging around, watching the kite. And I'm beginning to, you know, I'm getting this feeling, oh, that's my old man. See, it's my, yeah, my old man is really great, see. Well, it's going higher and higher and higher and higher. And as it gets higher, you know, this thing starts to climb way up into the blue. Fantastic climbing motion. Higher it's climbing. Higher and higher and higher it's going. What a scene. The old man is carefully paying out that line. And he's standing down there now at the end of about 400 feet of curving white string. And way at the top of it is this little red, tidy, dancing dot. You can see that tail flicking white, shiny. Higher and higher and higher it goes. That kite was really up. Higher and higher it goes. I think at that minute, something happened to all of us kids. I know it did to me. From that minute on, I began to believe subconsciously that one of the most beautiful things in the world is a flying kite. Way up against the blue, in a good 15 mile an hour summer wind, that tail flicking. He flew that kite for, oh, maybe a half an hour. And I might say this, uh, that, that the kites, a lot of kites that you see today, are re you know, the, 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 the so-called novelty type kites, you know, the plastic bats and all that stuff you see around, they don't have anywhere near the romance, nor the flying ability, incidentally, of a really good kite. I hate to disillusion you, friend, but that, that uh, flying bat or whatever it is you got in your backyard, ain't, <laughs> this is not much of a kite. That's really, there's a big difference between a toy and a flying instrument. And a real kite is a flying instrument. And ever since that time, you know, I've had this thing about just watching kites. I remember one time, speaking of the, uh, one of the most beautiful sights as far as kites are concerned, one day I was in Lagos, Nigeria, which is a very... Uh, the culture, everything, the feel, the smell, the bush is right out outside the city limits there. And you could smell the Indian Ocean, and and uh, it's just it's just a it's just an alien world there, very much of an alien world, but a beautiful, strange, exciting world. And I was I was walking along in in a part of Nigeria, just a lot of low, flat tin shacks. When I, I suddenly became aware of something, and I, it caught my eye, and I turned, and over these shacks, there were about 15 or 20 yellow and blue and green kites standing up in the air, about 40 or 50 feet up, just low. They were just hanging up there, just kites flying against that African sky. That was a beautiful sight, and I, I don't know of many more beautiful sights. And a few months ago, I had a chance to, 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 to do it again. I, I got myself a, a really good box kite. And by the way, if you're looking for kites, one of the best flying kites, quite possibly the best high altitude kite that is normally available is a box kite, as opposed to the square type kites. They fly beautifully. And if you get yourself a good box kite with a very light nylon cord, special, you know, they make special kite flying cord now. That kite will fly in practically no wind and will fly steady as a rock. Well, a few weeks ago, I shouldn't say weeks, about six or seven months ago, I was on the beach, a coral beach, the Gulf of Mexico, way down in the southern part of Florida on an island, Marco Island, as a matter of fact, and I had with me a box kite about three and a half feet tall which is a good sized box kite a beautiful box kite covered with the uh, Japanese silk and I had uh, 
1,100 feet of nylon kite flying, the lightest kite flying twine, nylon, and a reel. Well, it was a beautiful day. It was wind coming in, a soft wind from the Gulf, blowing inward. And uh, there were clouds, high clouds at about maybe 20 or 30,000 feet. And the sky was as blue as you can conceive of a sky being. That Gulf sky gets that way. Well, that baby started to climb. She just took off. She just climbed like a rocket. And I began to pay that twine out. Well, I, I, I paid it all out, 1,100 feet of twine, until that kite was such a tiny dot that you could hardly see it in the sky. And a guy went flying by. There was a little airport not too far away. And as a pilot, I knew just exactly what he was thinking. He went flying by in this uh, 150 Cessna. And I could just see him fly, but he dipped his wings and he made a slow pass at the kite and flew on. So you can see the altitude it was. That was one of the most beautiful kite flying afternoons I've ever had. And let me tell you one other thing that happened. It was on the other foot one day. One day I was flying a musketeer, a Beechcraft musketeer, which is a beautiful airplane. I was flying a Beechcraft musketeer into Bridgeport, the Bridgeport airport. The, the airport extends out into the water in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I was flying along the beach at about a thousand feet in Connecticut. It was a beautiful spring day when all of a sudden I saw something flash just a little bit below me and off to my left. I was flying north up the coastline. I saw something flash and I was out over the water. And then I looked down and I could see some people way down there on a, on a sandy, loamy beach. I saw something flash again. And there off to my left, about 50 feet below me, was a box kite standing there just standing in the air. It's a beautiful sight from the air. Remember that red kite slowly moving up, just slowly climbing. And I've often wondered people who, who don't have the, uh, I mean, whose glands don't relate to that. That's one connection I feel very tightly with the Japanese and the Chinese, the beautiful kite hanging high in the air. And then, of course, uh, there, there are all kinds of uh, other, other side issues to kites, which go on and on and on. Hi, I'm Oscar.